cast your minds back, if you will, to 1999's Pac-Man World. It was a 3D platformer first and foremost, but it contained a bunch of bonus levels in the form of mazes, because there needed to be a little of the classic formula in there. Well, the following year we got a game that kind of feels like the maze levels were extrapolated and placed into their own standalone title. It's also Pac-Man's second dip into time travel, although this time he doesn't de-age or turn into a completely different game. <laughs> Pac-Man Adventures in Time is a PC-only game which goes back to the old maze formula. It takes little bits from various different games. The classic Pac-Man gameplay, the variety of mazes from Miss Pac-Man, the jumping from Pac-Mania, and multi-level mazes, an expansion of an idea last seen in Pac-Man Arrangement. From this mix, we've got a nice little package here, and one that I was apparently a big fan of in 2001. This poor manual, eh? It's a Pac-Man game, but there's a little more to it than that. There's a great variety of level styles, and throughout the course of the single player adventure mode, you'll find yourself jumping in between different locations across time and space. Each level follows roughly the same formula, but there are neat little twists in the gameplay which keep the experience fresh. This river, for example, houses a crocodile that isn't affected by power pellets, but also can't leave the water. In this level, you don't get any power pellets whatsoever, mimicking their reduced effectiveness in later levels of the arcade game. Here's a good one, a level where you have to walk on the sides of this giant cube, but you have to do so before the power of your magical anti-gravity boots runs out. It's stupid, but it's enjoyable nonetheless. There's even a level that takes place on a moving train, something I've always had a soft spot for. I'm not overly fond of this tree, mainly because I can't see if I'm about to ram headlong into a ghost until it's slightly too late. In fact, the camera is zoomed in by default, but as in Pac-Mania, this is where the jump comes into play. And if you like, you can play with a top-down camera, although sometimes the user interface gets in the way and you can't see exactly where you are. Later on, you'll be faced with even more impassable obstacles, like snakes that stun you and lasers that'll kill you in one hit. The mazes become much more complex as well, sometimes playing across three different levels. It's quite impressive what they've managed to do, while still keeping the classic formula intact. Oh, and there are mini-games, but they're very token and only serve to break things up a bit. At least we get to see a pack t rex which is possibly the best thing I've seen all day. And a pack dragon I mean, you can't complain at that. Until he burns the pack to a crisp. Speaking of which, I'm really impressed by the attention to detail in the ghost designs. Each world has two or three different varieties of ghosts, and while most of them are kinda stereotypical, you've got your club-wielding cave dwellers in the prehistoric era, jackals and the like in Egypt, and mustachioed cowboys in the Wild West, it shows that there's been some real effort in making each level feel more unique. I particularly like the dragon ghosts, as well as this pink bug-eyed creature. Point is, they could've just kept the ghosts boring and vanilla, but, well, they went above and beyond. But that's not to say the original ghosts are totally absent. Spend too long on a stage, and they'll come along to show you how it's done. They're only slightly more threatening than the standard enemies, and you have to wait around a long, long time before they appear, but it's yet another nice feature. Outside of adventure mode, there's a bit of multiplayer going on. Unlike Pac-Man Arrangement, it's all competitive this time around. You have a choice of three different games. Dot Mania is like a pie-eating contest with dots, Time Bomb is like Hot Potato, and Ghost Tag is like Juggernaut. They're all fun little diversions, but I can't imagine they'll be the big event at your next LAN party. And the classic mode is a little more interesting this time. To me, this game is to Pac-Man as Space Invaders is to... uh, Space Invaders. It keeps enough of the original gameplay around for it to resemble the arcade game, but spices it up in such a way that it's genuinely a lot of fun to play. The main thing is, it feels like a Pac-Man game. Oh, and I must give honourable mention to the cheat codes. If you've ever wanted to play Pac-Man in first person, now you can. Something I find a little odd about this game is that it was a PC exclusive. You'd think something like this would be right at home on the PlayStation or the N64. Well, it turns out something like this did come out. And that something starred the female contingent of the Pac-Man universe. This is Miss Pac-Man Maze Madness. Serious Sam, is that you?
Its moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is quite similar to its PC counterpart, so there's not a great deal to add there. Miss Pac-Man loses the ability to jump whenever she likes, but she is endowed with the strength to be able to push blocks around, meaning you get the odd platforming puzzle thrown into your maze gameplay. You'll notice, in fact, that the levels in this game don't exactly follow the classic maze structure. While there are maze-like sections in each level, you're not stuck to one single maze for the entire thing. Nothing particularly groundbreaking, but enough to make this game stand out a little bit from the rest of the pack stable. The goal in each level is, effectively, to eat enough dots to move on to each consecutive section. I found that as long as I completed each maze, heralded by a useful little well done or something, I had more than enough dots to move on. Something I found interesting is that I still managed to leave a whole bunch of dots in each level, meaning that there are some pretty well hidden secrets to be found here too. Hmm, I'm coming to a realisation here. This is almost a 3D platformer, isn't it? It might not be a standard platforming fair, but I feel like it's got a lot of that DNA. Feels a lot like Pac-Man World in many respects. Along the way, you'll also meet a host of enemies outside of the usual handful of ghosts, such as this creep who fires projectiles at you you can barely avoid. He takes off half your health at once. And he makes a blood-curdling scream when you eat him. I suppose that makes sense. There's also the world's loudest caterpillar. And a mummy who has a bad case of bandicoot wannabe syndrome. There are undoubtedly a lot more enemies and things to find, but you'll notice I didn't get very far out of Egypt. That's because the levels are insanely long. Or they feel it, at least. I did get to the snow level, but I only have so much time to play each of these games. The following year, Miss Pac-Man had another game, and another bizarre case of PC exclusivity. You know, this almost feels like a demo for Maze Madness. It has the same setting at the very least, but is noticeably lower budget, with gameplay that attempts to emulate the original arcade game. It's a little like when publishers would produce Flash games to promote the full console counterparts. But that sounds like I'm saying Golden Maze is ahead of its time. It's really not. I just don't get why this exists. It doesn't do anything that the original didn't, and ends up a very middle-of-the-road pastiche of the arcade classic. Even the music doesn't want to know. Each loop only lasts a few seconds, and those few seconds aren't really worth hearing anyway. <laughs> It's not awful, I just struggle to understand why it was even made. It's at this point that the Pac-Man franchise begins to tread water. Again. Of course there was that period in the 80s where Midway was just churning out Pac-Man games left and right, most of which weren't really worth playing and just relied on the name. Well, this period saw a bit of a renaissance in the mid-2000s. Rather than explain what I mean by this, how about I just show you? Around this time, the party game was a bit of a thing. Mario Party is most often credited for the creation of this format, where multiple people compete in a series of minigames. But there were games like Hypersports and Point Blank in the arcades that kicked the trend off in the first place. In any case, after Mario Party came along and brought these pick up and play multiplayer experiences to home consoles, suddenly everybody wanted a piece of the pie. Sonic Shuffle, Fusion Frenzy, Rayman M and Crash Bash are just a few examples of the swathe of party games released during this period. All of these have their own gameplay quirks and unique features which set them apart from the crowd. And then there's Pac-Man Fever, which is one of the most mundane and irrelevant party games I've ever played. And no, I didn't mean irreverent. The first point I want to bring up is the selection of characters. I'll give them credit for drawing from a range of Namco properties, but... Actually, the range isn't that big. Heck, there are two characters here I didn't even recognise. Not that I'm massively versed in Namco lore, but you'll forgive me for thinking they could have gone with something more obvious. Like, you know, Pac-Man characters, since this is Pac-Man. The ghosts, Miru from pac and pal or Chomp Chomp would have all been good choices here. Or maybe other characters of a similar vintage. I'm thinking the likes of Puka and Taizo from Dig Dug. Maybe a Boss Gallica or the Galaxip, the car from Rally X. But no. What we have, aside from the pack himself and his female counterpart, are Astaroth from Soul Calibur, Reiko Nagasi from Ridge Racer, and Heiachi from Tekken. And also Tiger Jackson. 
Tiger Jackson, the alternative skin for a Tekken character who, as far as I'm aware, nobody particularly likes. So, great choice there. Honestly, these aren't bad choices of characters, but they just don't really seem to fit. Then again, as we'll get onto, nothing about this game really seems to fit. The game opens with plot. And really, of all the types of games that don't need a plot, party games have got to be top of the list. The idea here is that all of these characters, depicted here as movie stars, are due to compete for a trophy. And would you believe the trophy's been stolen by ghosts? Ghosts who then escape by flying through a locked glass door which is just too much for our heroes to handle. Why the trophy goes through the door, I don't know. Why Heiachi doesn't just break the door down, or they don't let Astaroth have a go at it with his gigantic axe, I don't know. And why the best solution here is to earn enough money to get through the locked door by competing in minigames? Well, it's just one of life's great mysteries, isn't it? Once you get past the title screen depicting each character flailing around like a drunk dad at a disco, you're given a couple of different options. You could play the minigames individually, if you've already unlocked them. Yes, really, none of them are available to just play freely out of the box. Doesn't it kind of defeat the point of a party game if you can't just pick it up and play? The main meat of the game is Fever Mode, which plays like a board game. At the start of each turn, you have to play a random minigame associated with whichever of the three boards you pick, and then you move a certain number of spaces based on how well you did. Each space has a different effect, which can serve to spice things up a little, and the winner is the first to finish. Sounds simple, but here's the problem. When you get to the final three spaces, you can only move ahead if you finish in a certain place in each minigame. If you're on the penultimate space, for example, you can't move to the finish unless you win the minigame. In both games I played, this ended up meaning all four characters got to the end, and it was just a case of whoever won the minigame won. It made the entire rest of the board feel a little pointless. I should also mention that you spend more time watching the players walk around than you do actually playing the minigames. But how about those minigames? Each board has its own set of games, and they're… alright for a PS2 party game. They're varied, and they can be a bit of fun, more so with others I suspect. I honestly struggle to say very much about them. They control well enough, they look fine, they work on a fundamental level. But well, the elephant in the room is, what have they got to do with Pac-Man? You're driving cars through a backlot. Okay, that ties in with the whole movie thing they had going in the intro. I mean, they could have done a Ridge Racer thing here, but whatever. So what's the deal with the bowling game? Or the fishing one? There's a game in which you have to jump over obstacles and stuff. Why isn't this Pac-Lan themed? There's one where you have to tap the X button at the right time to light up all the buttons on a vending machine, but all you need to do is learn the rhythm, and you've cracked it. How about this generic shooting gallery game? Did Namco forget they have not one, but three potential shooting games they could have used here? Heck, they could have nicked a game or two from Point Blank and that would have been fine. There's also an extra minigame when you land on a token square, in which you have to catch coins falling from the ceiling. <coughs> Youch, that's pretty gruesome. This is, once again, fine, but doesn't it remind you of something? And that is my main criticism of the game. The six characters you can pick, they could be any six characters. Would this game be any different at all if you replaced Pac-Man with, say, Spyro the Dragon? Heiachi with Daffy Duck? Tiger Jackson with, I don't know, Hulk Hogan? Point is, there's so much they could have done with the array of licenses they had access to, and they put out the most bog-standard, low-budget, zero-effort release possible. Namco actually produced another Pac-Man-themed party game for the Wii, about eight years later. Party! I won't dwell on it too much, since it actually has many of the same problems, mainly that the minigames have nothing much to do with anything. But it improves upon the previous game simply by being a much more refined and polished experience. The games play better, are more varied, and… well, they fit in a lot better than all the movie lot stuff. Amazingly, they also manage to avoid the classic Wii game pitfall that is waggle controls. M most of the time. The shooting gallery game remains unrelated to any of Namco's light gun properties, and the pinball game could have been a nice GB nod. But they at least have Pac-Man characters and… well, they look a bit weird, but… Maybe that's just a stylistic choice. Hang on, who are these? Roger? Patra? Woofer? Well, these characters were all made specifically for this game. I don't hate it, but I'm still waiting for the triumphant return of Miru. Make it happen, Namco. Oh, and one last thing. Pac-Man Party actually lets you play any one of the minigames straight away. Before we move on completely from the party game stable, there's one last game I want to look at. 
With the previous two games, I've pointed out that the minigames bear little resemblance to the games they're based on. And Pac-Man All-Stars is what happens when you go too far in the other direction. Quick fact file, it's from 2002 and it's another PC exclusive. And it has, oh, just let me check now, uh, one minigame. In fact, it's very similar to the multiplayer mode from Adventures in Time, except there's no maze. Yeah, this is it. You dumped into a level and you have to run around eating all the dots. This would be fine if it was a single minigame in a larger collection, and would work really well as part of one of the other two party games. But having an entire game hinged around this one premise? It gets old fast. You do have power-ups and things to spice up the gameplay a little, but if you can work out what the power-ups actually do, then you're more observant than I. Perhaps the most fun thing to do is start a game with four computer-controlled players, and watch the AI slowly lose its mind. Eventually, all the characters get stuck in a loop where they can't decide whether to go for the power-up or the dot, which means a game can last literally forever if you let it. It's a shame to see the Pac-Man series following trends, where it was once a leader. Take Pac-Man World Rally for instance, a game that was released amongst a slew of kart racing games, and that doesn't do anything better than certain other games do. Okay, let's give this game its day in court. And I've got to say, the track design isn't bad at all. There are some moments where you can't entirely tell where the track goes, and sometimes you end up bumping into the walls left and right because the corners are too tight, but the fact remains, they're fun to drive around in. Along the way you can find power-ups and pack dots. The former are very generic bombs and things, set in some very familiar colours, wonder where they got that idea from. And if you eat enough of the latter, your car turns into the Pac-mobile, allowing you to gobble up the other racers as they flee on the unicycles. It's always a little disconcerting, however, when you yourself turn into a blue ghost, even if you're playing as Pac-Man himself. This is a fun gameplay feature, although it does make it a little too easy for whoever's in first place to maintain the lead. The way you activate shortcuts is also a nice touch. Rather than blowing up walls or driving off road into uncharted territory, you collect fruit dotted around the track and use that to buy your way in. I find it a little odd that you have to activate the fruit pickups before you can collect them. Although, this does force you to go around the track normally at least once. Maybe this is a way of levelling the playing field, so that potential shortcut takers don't end up miles ahead after the first lap. Or maybe the developers really wanted you to see the tracks they'd spent such a long time making. Although, that's a bit of a challenge in itself, given how close the camera is to your car. A little elbow room wouldn't go amiss. As it is, this is part of the reason why the tracks can be a little difficult to navigate. The second reason is that the cars feel really clumsy. You see, a good kart racing game makes you feel as if you have just enough control over your vehicle, and not to feel like you're fighting against it. In Pac-Man World Rally, you definitely feel like you're fighting against it. Each vehicle supposedly has different stats, but they all handle like buses, not like nippy little go-karts. The sluggish frame rate doesn't really help either, and I know that frame rate is a contentious topic, but racing games really do live and die on the frame rates. Daytona USA proved that much. And the third reason is that you get hit by everything. And getting hit by projectiles every which way is, indeed, a standard part of any good kart racer. But most kart racers just have the projectiles hit you and have done with it. Green shells, bowling bombs and so on just knock your kart about a bit, and then send you on your merry way. Not Pac-Man World Rally, oh no. Let me tell you, these bombs are the most hateful items I've ever seen in a game of this type. Because not only do they stop you dead in your tracks, they give you the muckiest look while doing so. Why have they got to stare me right in the eye like that? Is the satisfaction of putting me back a few places by way of explosive ordnance not enough for you, bomb? The selection of characters is a little bizarre. You've got your pack family as expected. You've got your four ghosts who don't really look the best. You've also got Tokman, last seen in Pac-Man World. Nice to see a bit of a callback for once. But I have no idea who Spooky is. Or Irwin, for that matter. He doesn't even look like a Pac-Man character. What's he from? I guess I must have missed a game or two. You can also unlock Puka from Dig Dug, and the Prince from Katamari Damacy. But to do that, you have to use the Pac-Mobile to eat a certain amount of races in a specific circuit. Bit of an unusual method, but I suppose it's in keeping with the franchise. Overall, this isn't a bad racing game, but it could have done with a bit of refinement. Give me a polished high-speed world rally with improved handling and maybe let me play as someone from Gallagher. 
and I think this could have been a fantastic little racer. As it is, it's fine. It also goes to demonstrate that they really need to come up with some new music for Pac-Man. Nearly every music track is a remix of the same two songs from the original arcade game, and it gets very old very quickly. Namco would later go on to collaborate with Nintendo to create the Mario Kart Arcade GP series, and naturally, Pac-Man and friends were guest characters in each of those. So, I guess there is a happy ending to all this. Judging by the games we've just seen, you'd think all hope was lost for the pack. Are all his games doomed to be remarkably average from this point on? Thankfully, that isn't the case. Because much like Space Invaders, Pac-Man's best work in the mid-2000s came on the handhelds. And when Nintendo brought out their succinctly named touchscreen based handheld, Namco saw an opportunity. No, I'm not using that clip again. As well as the requisite Namco Museum collection, which of course contains an arcade accurate version of the original Pac-Man, there were a couple more Pac games which made better use of the DS's unique hardware. The first is Pac Picks, released in early 2005, and it's, well, it's definitely a DS game. Without oversimplifying it too much, what you do is draw Pac-Mans to eat the ghosts. Okay, maybe I should explain a little further. But first, we have this nonsense to deal with. You know it's a Pac-Man game when there's reams of unnecessary plot before you get to play it. The gist is that some mischievous wizard has made a pot of ghost ink. Anything you write in ghost ink becomes a ghost, because, I don't know, ghosts. They spread out to other books, because ghosts. So Pac-Man, armed with his... magic pen, miraculously manages to corner the ghost within a single book. And instead of doing the sensible thing of immediately burning the book, he gets himself captured instead. And then he shows you his magic pen. Honestly, I couldn't make this sound more dodgy if I tried. Anyway, once you passed all that, the game really is just a case of drawing a vaguely Pac-Man shaped doodle, which will then wander around the screen and eat the ghosts. You can also draw lines to direct your Pac-Man around the screen and keep him going for as long as possible. If you're feeling extra daring, you can draw up to three at a time on the same screen, although it does get a little crowded if you try that. There are several different varieties of ghosts as well, each of which act differently. Pink ghosts wander around and don't really care if they get eaten. That nihilistic facial expression says it all. The blue ghosts try to dart away if you get close, but they eventually succumb to the mighty maw of magic pen Pac-Man. White ghosts effectively have two hit points, with the first hit teleporting them across the screen. And there are even bosses. What more do you want? The thing I'm most impressed by in this game is just how lenient it is about your Pac-Man drawings. You don't have to be precise in the slightest. They can have overbites, underbites, gigantic T-Rex jaws or tiny little mouths. They can be circles, ovals, sometimes even rectangles. And each one is animated pretty much perfectly. I suppose when there are only two things you can draw, one of them being a straight line, you better hope that the drawing part is spot on. And it really is. You only need to look at some of my attempts here makes the Apple Newton look like an even bigger piece of junk. But the trouble is, this is kind of all there is. It's a nice diversion, but I played for a good long while, and it didn't really change. However, I do concede that it's not meant to be played in one long session, but in short snatches. It doesn't matter too much if the gameplay doesn't change, because you don't expect it to change all that much. You pick up pack picks, and you know what you're getting. And that is okay. I also really like the art style, which is very different from any Pac-Man game we've seen previously. It really fits the storybook thing they have going on. This wouldn't be the Pac's only touchscreen adventure. A mere four months later, Namco brought out pac and roll which is... a 3D platformer? Kinda? In this game, Pac-Man is a ball. I'm not going to bother paraphrasing the plot this time because there's just too much. Long and short of it, there's a dude called Golvis, and he's a ghost. For that reason, he is Pac-Man's mortal enemy. Do we maybe need to ask if Pac-Man's prejudiced against ghosts? Another issue that nobody talks about. To control Pac-Man, you roll him around on the touchscreen. Quite a bit like Hyperball, actually. With a special dash move available if you hold your stylus at the edge of the screen. The game involves navigating each area, eating dots, avoiding ghosts, the usual. Along with some light platforming, which relies on the use of ramps and seesaws. You can also find a variety of power-ups, such as the metal cap, sorry, the helmet, which makes Pac-Man heavier and allows him to roll around underwater. The <clears throat> cap with wings on it gives him the ability to float in mid-air. Other than that, it is not really too dissimilar to games we've already seen. 
You've got the dots you have to eat, you've got power pellets and ghosts and things. It's very much Pac-Man World 2 crossed with Maze Madness, but with a spherical pack. Generally quite fun, although admittedly a bit of a pain to play with the standard control scheme. As luck would have it, Pack and Roll was also released on the Wii, as part of the Namco Museum remix in 2007, and this is the version you've been watching. I'd say play this one, if only to save your DS screen from getting scratched up too much. It'd be remiss of me, of all people, to talk about handheld Pac-Man games without mentioning the incredible Pac-Man Pinball Advance, released for the Game Boy Advance, after both of these DS games. Yeah, rather than develop it for a device which has two vertical screens and is therefore perfectly suited for pinball. Anyway, this game stinks. It's not a good game of pinball. The flippers have no power behind them, the objectives are unclear, and there's very little Pac-Man going on here whatsoever. On the plus side, each of the two tables has an alternative version that makes it look like a real table. Tell you what would have been fun, if they remade Baby Pac-Man as the DS game. Would have been a pretty good fit, I reckon. Instead, we're stuck with a generic, lacklustre pinball game with very little going on. I guess you can't win them all. Pac-Man was in a bad way. His games were getting further and further away from what made the original so great in the first place, and he was at absolute rock bottom. Don't believe me? Well, see for yourself. By this time, our yellow friend had found his way to the casual PC game market, which is a bit like when comedians find their way onto cruises. It's just not a good look for anyone. This is 2010's Pac-Man Pizza Parlor, published by Big Fish Games, one of the few survivors of the early digital distribution era. This really exists and is a full game you can buy. It'll also work on a Pentium 3 apparently, which is quite incredible. As with so many of the Pac-Man games we've looked at lately, there's a whole intro detailing this unnecessary plot. So this girl Kathy takes over her dad's restaurant, but instead of doing the sensible thing of, you know, hiring kitchen staff, she instead puts a quarter into a mysterious arcade machine, and out jumps Pac-Man, who proceeds to help her out by preparing ingredients and stuff. This exists. The gameplay consists of Pac-Man shuffling around a maze, and all credit to them, there is at least a maze involved, picking up ingredients in the right order, which Kathy can then pick up and serve to customers. Sometimes you have to stick it in the microwave, but most of the time you can just serve the food as is to the barely animated patrons of the pizza parlour. There are also ghosts, which don't do much except get in the way. It has absolutely nothing to do with Pac-Man, although after the games I've played, I don't really know what does have anything to do with Pac-Man. It just feels like he's been shoehorned in here for the name and the name alone. And I suppose amongst the Big Fish clientele, there's got to be some brand recognition here. But frankly, I've only included this game because somebody has to. I only have one question at this point. Why is this? Twenty ten was also a pretty important year for the pack. You know, being his 30th anniversary and all. As far as I can tell though, there wasn't actually a great deal of fanfare for this one. Possibly they were saving their energy for Gallagher's anniversary the following year. Despite this, there was a celebration at that year's E3. Alongside some limited edition merchandise, including a very classy wallet, a watch, a pair of wine glasses? Not what I would have picked, but okay. Namco also made a new Twitter account for the occasion, which is all in Japanese. But perhaps the most prevalent part of the anniversary was the Google Doodle. Also known as the bane of offices and schools everywhere. Essentially, Google's Pac-Man game is the classic game we all know and love. Except the maze spells out Google this time. That's really the only change they've made. It kind of goes to demonstrate the importance of the original maze design as well, because this one has a lot of dead ends and weird junctions, where you can easily get caught if you're not careful. But realistically, this is just a bit of a novelty. The maze design doesn't matter too much, since this was just a free thing put out on Google's homepage for a day. Clearly the big G were expecting repeat playthroughs to some extent though, because they actually went to the trouble of replicating the original AI. As far as I can tell anyway. They each retreat to the four corners of the maze before going on the offensive at least, so it displays some working knowledge of how they're supposed to act. And indeed, you can still play this game today by searching for Pac-Man in Google. Simple as that really. Did this mean the pack was back, as the marketing slogan indicated? Well, another facet of the pack being back was that Namco had commissioned a brand new cartoon based on him, called Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures. The show itself is a very humdrum sort of affair, which manages to make the Hanna-Barbera cartoon look like a masterpiece. 
But the main reason I bring this up is because there was a game based on this series, which shared the same title and presumably the same plot points. Not that any of that's explained in the game. Start it up and you're immediately thrown in with a bunch of characters with no introductions. Cersei! We're here! We got here as fast as we could! It sounded important! Why would Cersei call us and then not be here when we showed up? Don't get your power berries in a bunch! I'm right here! <laughs> Yikes! Whoa! This game demands you know the lore going in. Even down to the fact that Pac-Man has parents and that everything around here starts with the word Pac. Apparently there are some globes which look suspiciously like the thing from Adventures in Time. And Pac-Man's job is to find energy to power them. If you come across any orbs, they're important too, but I'll tell you about them later. Okay, no problem. Except that job is made somewhat more difficult because the city is currently under a ghost invasion and they lack the necessary defensive infrastructure to deal with it. So, it turns out this game is a 3D platformer. As in, literally a 3D platformer. As in, the world is made up of disparate platforms that you navigate in a 3D space. Good grief, this isn't 1995 anymore. We've moved on from this sort of design. Moving around the world generally feels good. The controls are responsive, the jumping is crisp, and the attack range is fair. Goblin ghosts can be pretty satisfying, especially if you manage to chain a few together. However, there are no extra movement abilities by default, so it does make the moment to moment gameplay a bit bland. You do have a double jump, but some sort of slide or dash would not be unwelcome. Unfortunately, that's all the positive things I have to say about this game. I've played a lot of 3D platformers, you see. And while this one isn't necessarily terrible, it does absolutely nothing to advance the genre, and feels very much like a budget game, just one that's had a bit more polish. Indeed, I'd say it even pales in comparisons to Pac-Man's earlier PlayStation adventures, because they at least had a lot of unique mechanics going for them, and managed to work Pac-Man's signature tropes into the platforming gameplay. But what we have here is about as generic as they come, and with a lot of its gameplay, I found myself thinking about other games more so than this one. There are hints of Ratchet and Clank in terms of moment to moment stuff, the power ups are reminiscent of Rayman 3 and Super Mario Galaxy, and, I hate to say it, but the level design really has a Bubsy 3D vibe to it. If your game can be compared to Bubsy 3D, you've got problems on your hands. The reason I say this is because all the platforms are... well, the platforms. Each one is just a block floating in the air. Sometimes there's a fountain on it, and sometimes there are bins and lampposts and stuff, but it's all so sparse and disconnected that I don't feel immersed in this world. Compare this to, say, Spyro the Dragon. You could argue that the layout is the same sort of deal, but the fact that it's all built into a cohesive world, with NPCs wandering around and plenty of scenery and collectibles to fill in the gaps, makes it so much more enjoyable to explore. It's believable, in a way that Pac-Man isn't. And the loading screens. What feels like every five minutes you come across one of these pneumatic tubes which transports you to... the... Uh, the next set of homogenous platforms. Except that Pac-Man treats them as if he's never used them before. And it grates. Pac-Man! The annoying part is that the background looks like a more interesting space to play in. But we don't get to see any of that. The only other location is this... building. Yeah, I'm not sure what this is even supposed to be. It's a school, except it's also a laboratory, but the mayor is also here. And there's only one classroom, and there are arcade cabinets scattered about the place. Once again, the decoration is sparse, and the whole space just feels lifeless. I think that's the main issue I have with Ghostly Adventures. It's lifeless. It lacks a level of personality, which feels to me like an intrinsic part of a good 3D platformer and the characters are, frankly, unlikable at best. The ghost voice lines are fun the first couple of times you hear them, but they recycle the same few over and over. Pac-Man himself is grating and the cutscenes are stilted. I'm afraid this one just has nothing going for it, and I'd pick any other 3D platformer over this one. Except for Gex. Well, judging from what we've seen in this video, you'd be forgiven for thinking that Pac-Man's gone downhill a little. But our spherical singularity stomached acquaintance didn't give up, and it must be said that some of the games we've looked at go to demonstrate the pack's versatility as a character. Sure, there's been some absolute rubbish in the series, but there have also been some interesting and innovative titles as well, and games that I can see myself going back to at some point. And to round off this retrospective, I'd like to finish off with some of Pac-Man's greatest hits. For Galaga's 30th anniversary, Namco produced a game called Galaga Legions, one that I covered in that video. But there was another game born of the same stock, and originally released on Xbox Live Arcade in 2007, 
and one that had seen just a tad more popularity. That game is Pac-Man Championship Edition. This game originated out of a desire to call back to the classic arcade experience, one that, even if the games were good otherwise, had been lost somewhat over the years. It was designed to really hone into what Pac-Man was best at, the maze game. The game was designed by none other than Toru Iwatani himself, to date this is his most recent work. Other members of the team were director Tadashi Iguchi and producer Nobutaga Nakajima, and their goal was to bring Pac-Man into the HD generation. Before this, the original arcade game had been brought to the Xbox 360 via the arcade, but the issue that they saw was that the vertical screen resolution just wasn't suitable anymore, and they saw the potential to not only make the game widescreen, but also to modernise the whole experience, bringing in new players while also appealing to Pac-Man's older fans. Pac-Man Combat Evolved was the result, and I'd say it just about hits the mark. Right from the outset you can see that the old school formula is back and in full swing. You get a maze, you get four ghosts, you get dots to eat and power pellets and fruit, and your goal is to get a high score. It's as much an arcade game as you can get without actually being in an arcade. You also get limited lives, but you get enough of them handed out that it's not really much of a problem. No, the problem is that ever ticking clock. In the regular championship mode, you get 5 minutes to score as many points as you can. The other modes are roughly the same thing, but with different mazes and time limits. Eating all of the dots will spawn a piece of fruit. Eating the fruit means more dots are dropped onto the level. Working out the specific patterns to get around these assorted table arrangements makes for a satisfying gameplay loop. But you've also got to account for the ghosts, whose sole job is to make life exceedingly difficult for you. This isn't an easy game by any means, and what's more, it gradually gets faster and faster the longer you play. All of this makes for a frantic edge of your seat sort of experience, and it's a great deal of fun. Three years later, Namco decided to refresh the experience and bring it to all manner of other systems. Pac-Man Championship Edition DX was the result, which was followed up by DX Plus, the version available today. Essentially, it plays pretty much the same as the original CE, but with some gameplay differences that set it apart from its predecessor. In that sense, it feels more of a sequel than a straight upgrade, but I digress. The biggest difference is a vastly increased emphasis on ghosts. Rather than just sticking with the original 4, DX seems to throw ghosts at your left and right. Tell you what though, this lot are a right bunch of slackers. They hide in their little corners and snooze until Pac-Man gets close, at which point they're so perturbed by the yellow dude's intrusive action that they start to chase him around the maze. It doesn't take long until you've got this massive conga line of ghosts on your tail. Seems intimidating, but... Well, you can imagine just how satisfying it is when you manage to get a power pellet down here. Because of the greater numbers of ghosts, the pack is also given an extra ability to help deal with them if they get a bit much. You start each level with a supply of bombs, which can be used at any time to temporarily clear the screen of ghosts. This isn't quite as useful as it sounds though. More often than not, the ghosts get plopped back on the stage in some pretty inconvenient locations, meaning you've either got to get lucky with the power pellet, or use yet another bomb. It can also get so hectic and fast that it's difficult to quickly see where you're supposed to be going. Sometimes you'll find that you've either turned into a corridor too early or too late, meaning you have to employ your snake skills to get back where you're supposed to be without crashing into the ghost trailing incessantly behind you. Your mileage may vary on that front though, and it doesn't make the game any less fun or exciting. I think the designers succeeded in their goal, and produced an excellent update to the Pac-Man formula that still feels pretty fresh and playable today, much like the original. But if it's a little too modern and hip for you, maybe you'd like to try the NES version. Yes, this exists. As part of Namco Museum Archives Volume 1, a collection of NES conversions of classic Namco arcade games. Seems an odd concept to me, but what do I know? This version plays pretty much identically to the original Championship Edition, and even has chiptune remixes of Pac-Man themes that haven't otherwise been heard in over 30 years, including this excellent pac and pal remix. <laughs> The best part is that this actually works on real Famicom hardware. The NES too, but that apparently requires a little modification to your console. According to Ars Technica, 
This version originated as far back as 2008, as a homebrew ROM developed by a Japanese fan going by the handle Coke774. At the time it was never released, presumably to avoid any legal issues, and there was talk in 2015 of bringing it to the 3DS, before that version was dropped in favour of the Switch version. There's a whole rabbit hole in this story, but the point is, this project that could very easily have been lost forever has actually been released in an official capacity. Not often we see something like that happen. Now, how about a physical cartridge? Before we move on from Pac-Man Consumer Electronics, there's one extra little detail I haven't discussed yet. There was a sequel, released about 9 years later for the following generation of consoles. From initial appearances, it looks kinda similar. And, well, it is very similar, in that you're still Pac-Man, you're still roaming around a maze, and there are still scores of ghosts who would really prefer it if you stopped living. However, dig a little deeper and there are enough differences to make CE2 its own unique experience. The most noticeable difference is that ghosts aren't as deadly as they usually are. Either that or Pac-Man's got a thicker skin this time around, because he can crash headlong into ghosts whenever he likes. Give them a nudge, they won't mind. Much. Yeah, poke them too often and they'll get angry and start hunting you down. So while you do get a little more leeway, you do well not to abuse it. To balance this out, you don't get anywhere near as many power pellets. These changes definitely breed a different approach to gameplay than its predecessor. Another major change with the ghosts is that they don't all immediately chase you once you wake them up. In fact, most of the ghosts don't act autonomously at all. They'll just tag along with one of the four main fellas. While this reduces the risk of running into one accidentally, it does make the ghost lines a lot less predictable overall, and it means you can get yourself boxed in if you're not careful. Following the dot patterns is much trickier as a result, and you really have to think about your moves in advance, especially when you chow down on a power pellet. Eating ghosts is not a simple case of just swallowing them if they get too close. In this game, you have to attack them from the front. This is a double-edged sword. It makes them really hard, sometimes infuriatingly so to catch. But once you do, by golly is it satisfying. The mazes work a little differently as well. Rather than reshaping themselves with new dot patterns and layouts, once you eat a fruit, you get thrown into a whole new maze. It's a minor difference in the grand scheme of things, but a noticeable one nonetheless. You also have the option to play any of the original DX mazes with the new rules, meaning you have a whole ton of content to play with. It feels a little odd calling this a sequel since it doesn't exactly replace the original game, but both are definitely worth a go and serve as equally valid updates to the game we all know and love. If Championship Edition wasn't in the arcades, what was exactly? Surely the pack had some degree of arcade presence, even at a time when the arcades were largely dead and buried. Well, I say largely. Arcades never really died, they just changed. And while they became less about being the forefront of video game technology, and more about coin pushers and those horrible brick games, they still retained their social background. As such, the modern arcade is the perfect place where a game like Pac-Man Battle Royale could thrive. And if you've been to an arcade within the last 10 years, you'll likely have seen it in action. Another product of Pac-Man's 30th anniversary, the arcade exclusive Battle Royale is quite simply a competitive Pac-Man game for up to 4 players. Your objective? Survive. There really isn't a whole lot else I can add, it really is as straightforward as that. You and up to 3 other Pac-Mans are thrown into a small maze together, along with the requisite ghosts, and whoever doesn't die is crowned the victor. There are two ways to remove the opposition, the first is to wait until they slip up, and the second is to go cannibal mode on them with a power pellet. There are also dots you can eat, but without a score counter to speak of, their only purpose is to spawn further dots and power pellets after they're all eaten. That's about all there is to the game, honestly. But what makes it special is that social aspect that I talked about before. You see those lines pointing to different corners of the screen? In the arcade, these pointed to each player's controls, effectively showing you who was where on the screen. But this was originally a tabletop game. You surely wouldn't be able to see much when there are four people crowding the machine. Well, the deluxe cabinet version had a much larger display that could be viewed by onlookers quite easily. Not only that, but the cabinet can be connected to virtually any display. A little personal history from me here. I remember seeing Battle Royale in some seaside arcade, and they had projected it onto a wall in front of the players. I know this isn't really to do with the game itself, but the fact that it's such a simple game to get your head around means that you can have a good time with it. 
And if there's a big group of you, and the game is displayed so that everyone can see it, I'd say that makes for a pretty memorable experience. As it stands, the game is a fun little pick up and play thing. But wait, if it truly is an arcade exclusive as I said, how am I sat here, during lockdown of all things, playing this game from the comfort of my own home? It was released on the PC via Steam in 2014, as well as on Xbox 360 and PS3, via Pac-Man Museum. Pac-Man Museum. This is a compilation of Pac-Man games which contains a whole bunch of titles we've already looked at, all wrapped up in a front end featuring the characters from Ghostly Adventures. Ew. In addition to Battle Royale, the museum also features the original Championship Edition, as well as the previously PSP exclusive Pac-Man arrangement, not the arcade version. Quite a nice package, but tragically, it's not currently available to buy through official channels. And finally, to bring us almost up to the present day, let's finish off with a game that takes a different approach to the idea of modernising Pac-Man. But first, a tiny little history lesson. The original Pac-Man arcade game records which level you're currently on in an 8-bit integer. Now, the maximum number you can possibly store in 8 bits is 255, which means that the maximum level you can theoretically get to in Pac-Man is 255. The programmers at Namco seemingly never considered that anybody would ever get that far. After all, the game becomes insanely difficult after a certain point, where power pellets have no effect and the ghosts huff it like they're late for a party. So it wasn't an entirely unreasonable assumption, until somebody actually did clear level 255, and was greeted with what is now an infamous aspect of Pac-Man, the kill screen. This is Maze 256, caused by an integer overflow, which effectively means the game has absolutely no idea which level you're on, and makes no attempt to find out. As a result, half the level is a garbled mess, where nothing is true and everything is permitted. Under normal parameters, this level is impossible to beat, since it doesn't spawn all 244 dots. As such, this can be considered the definitive end of the game. The legendary status of the kill screen was turned into its own game, developed by Hipster Whale, whose previous hit was the Frogger-inspired Crossy Road. Welcome to Pac-Man 256. Or is it 256? Or maybe 256? Or maybe this program will not run because your colour depth is too high. Anyway, to mirror what I've already said several times, Pac-Man 256 is a modern retelling of the ancient Pac-Man saga. Pac-Man's in a maze, there are ghosts, there are power pellets. You've heard it all before, right? What makes this one different is that, rather than completing a maze, the goal is to make it as far up the screen as possible before one of two things happens. Either you crash into a ghost and explode violently into a pile of voxels, or you succumb to the horrifying, all-consuming glitch. The second aspect effectively makes this a Pac-Man flavoured infinite runner, which calls back to the original enough to feel like a Pac-Man game, but adds its own unique twist such that it stands up in its own right. What would a Pac-Man game be without power-ups? You've got the ever-present power pellets, which allow you to eat ghosts with impunity. But on top of these, you also have an arsenal of new toys to play with. You've got bombs, lasers, tornadoes, freezing ice, boiling lava, and something that feels a little like the thing from Super Pac-Man, but a lot more useful. If you've ever wanted to take out your frustration on those ghosts, this is the game for you. Not that the ghosts are going to take that sitting down, of course. They've brought some new friends along too. The Sleeping Ghost makes a return from Combat Evolved DX, as well as the blockades of green and purple ghosts who all hang around together. You also have Glitchy, the ghost who can appear in random places and disappear just as easily. Each ghost has its own method of attack, which are somewhat inspired by their original behaviours, but are mostly just there to make best use of the level layout. Blinky chases you as far as possible, Pinky moves very quickly but will wait until she sees you before striking. Inky just runs around in circles, and Clyde bizarrely floats with purpose towards the glitch, clearly has had enough of this world. The other ghosts take the names from ones we've seen previously as well. Funky and Spunky make a return, but they don't jump around as in Pac-Mania. Spunky is the sleeping ghost and will chase you if you get too close to her, and Funkies roam around in packs of four, moving across the maze. You also have Sue, who acts a little like Funky in that they form groups of three. However, they will slowly follow Pac-Man's horizontal position, making them a bit of a headache to get past at times. All these new gameplay features really spice up what could have easily been a very dull game. They encourage you to learn the patterns and work out the best way of outmanoeuvring each ghost, while also being able to eat as many dots and fruit as possible. A little bit like the original, which makes sense. There is one extra facet to the gameplay I haven't mentioned though. 
you'll notice that there are sometimes breaks and gaps in the dots. You may also twig that your current eating streak is shown above Pac-Man's head. Well, if that streak hits 256... So, not only do you have to think about avoiding the ghosts, collecting fruit and acquiring power-ups, you also have to try doing all that while maintaining the perfect line. It's a tricky balance to maintain, and it's very easy to slip up and get yourself boxed in. But the more you play, the more power-ups you unlock and upgrades you can afford. Hmm, am I perhaps suggesting that Pac-Man 256 is a roguelite? Nah, yeah, probably not. But the point is, it's got replay value too. All in all, what we have here is a wonderful alternative modernisation of the Pac-Man formula. And it's free on mobile, so it's certainly worth the price of admission. And that brings us to a close. The games I've looked at serve as an overview of the Pac-Man franchise over the past 40 years, the variety of gameplay, the ups and downs, and everything in between. And for each game I've looked at, there's at least one that I either don't have access to, or just don't know about. Like Pac-Man Friends, the 2014 mobile game with a multiplayer slant. Pac-Man and Galaga Dimensions, a 3DS exclusive with a variety of different experiences. And Galaga, of course. There's Pac-Man Party Royale for Apple Arcade, there's Pac-Man Mega Tunnel Battle for the Stadia, <laughs> yeah right. And the most recent entry in the series, Pac-Man 99 for the Switch. A Battle Royale game which seems to take ideas not only from Pac-Man Battle Royale and Championship Edition, but also from Space Invaders DX. Sure, yep, that's totally where they took the inspiration, 100%. The idea of this game is that 99 players each simultaneously play a round of Pac-Man, and can sabotage each other by eating ghosts. Whoever's left standing at the end becomes... The Pac-1! And that's not even getting into Pac-Man's appearances outside of his own series. They invented Pac-Man? That cherry chasing dot muncher isn't even part of this game! I've already mentioned that he was a supporting character in the Mario Kart arcade GP games, but what about Tekken Cross Street Fighter? He may have used a big wooden mech in this game, but he'd learnt to fight on his own by the time he made it to Super Smash Bros. And then he became a spaceship in Galaga Wars, because of course he did. Pac-Man and Sonic appeared in each other's mobile games in 2018, Pac-Man made his way into Minecraft in 2020, Pac-Man became a theme in the Sandbox Evolution in 2017, meaning anyone could make their own maze with a variety of ghosts and power-ups and stuff. And how about those ghosts? Well, they appeared in the X68000 port of Galaga 88 in one of the challenging stages. They also show up in Galaga Legion's DX as an unlockable skin, and rather unexpectedly, in a secret level in Wolfenstein 3D. Yeah, the pack still got one heck of a reputation. I'd even go so far as to say the original sprite is one of the greatest examples of graphic design the world's ever seen. It's up there with I Love NY and the Mickey Mouse silhouette as an instantly recognisable form. Even if you've never played Pac-Man, you know what this is. And without any hard data to back me up at all, I'm willing to bet that Pac-Man is the most knocked off game in existence. The vast amount of Pac-Man clones out there, and that are still produced even today, is just so staggering that you can't even place a number on it. In short, you can give me all this pack is back business. Truth is, the pack was never gone. And now, 40 years later, we're still stuck with him. <laughs>